Thank you. Is that power of cosmos arising as a pure intelligence as your whole body in all its functions? Thank you. Heartbeat, breath, sex, eyes perceiving, ears perceiving, mind that can think. You know, I don't want to give a bad rap to the mind. The mind is amazing. Amazing phenomena of life, of the human condition, that we have this mind. Wow, I can think about things. And I can talk to you. You know, I can say, my mind can say, I love you. I'm not sure any other species do that. But us humans can do that. How amazing. And you are the... You are the power of the cosmos arising as a pure intelligence and utter beauty. Utter. Have you noticed that everything in the natural world is completely beautiful? Completely. Have you? Yes. Yeah. It's quite clear to you, isn't it, that you are also of the natural world? Yes. Yeah. So that beauty is your state. You are the beauty of reality itself. Are you with me? Yes. Right. Are you also with me that your body is presently in a perfect harmony with the rest of the cosmos? Already it's in that harmony. Already it's in that harmony. Your body is in harmony with air and light. Isn't it? Yes. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'm so, so beautiful to see your your smile at that uh, no, acknowledgement of that fact yes of course it is your these this lung system taking in air this biology a profound energetic biochemical relationship of your body with air and it already knows what it's doing with it you know i'd say your body is in love with air and your body is in love with light you know, if the sun disappears, eight more minutes of human life. Light. And how wonderful to live in this land here. Uh, the land of light is so beautiful being in Perth. For that very reason. You're so lucky, you people. I've been in some miserable places. <laughs> <laughs> Ireland, England. Like, ugh. Even their summer. <laughs> Even their summer. Ugh. So anyway, I make my case, and what about water? You know, the beautiful relation, this body, this organism with water, is at one with water? And the green realm, the plant kingdom, our nutrition, we are at one with it. You are that. Right? So, why would we seek for anything? Why would you bully yourself in some arbitrary social structure, what we call the social dynamic of disempowerment, that there's some perfect person like Christ or somebody, or some Indian guru or whatever, you know, and you have to behave and work on yourself to become like them? Why did we fall for that hoax? That nonsense, that absurdity that's made the human life miserable. When you are the power of the cosmos arising as pure intelligence and unspeakable beauty in perfect harmony with the cosmos. So could you answer that for me, please? You've been conditioned to seek. Thank you. <laughs> programmed in every way. Could I challenge you? Born into a society that programs you. Yes, sir. I only from something you said yesterday where what we've done to the place and to mum might have bred some disease in the water in the way we age in uh, it's a bit grim but in the general <laughs> sorry I but love your uh, Australian <laughs> it's a bit grim <laughs> <laughs> to be convinced which I am because you get snippets of it through the conditioning but Sometimes you also wonder if we've lost it, um, or if you can I really be. So what I'm asking you mm. is, no matter how bad things are 
in your life, in your circumstance, in your patterns that you've been born into, that you adopted yourself and did some crazy shit in your life maybe. Right? And no matter how bad the ecologies are getting presently with poison water and poison atmosphere and Australia burning down, you know, and toxifying the air. I was over in New Zealand and we had three days of the the sky went dark at two o'clock in the afternoon mm. and the sun went red two o'clock all day and it got very cold. It was freaky, man. Mm. It was truly like end of times. Mm -hmm. The last days of human life. It felt like that. Scary stuff. But I'm saying no matter what goes on in your circumstance, you are the power of the cosmos. Mm. You're, look, it, May I ask you, everybody, this present speaker in front of us, is that the power of the cosmos lying there on the floor? It's not very yogurt. <laughs> I've got to sort these. Is that the power of the cosmos? <laughs> I want an answer, yes or no. Is that power, thank you, is it yes, sir? Is it, right? Is, is, is that power the beauty of the cosmos along with everything else. Is it yes or no? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> no matter what's going on, mm. is is that the intelligence of life functioning right there, right now? Yes or no? Yeah. Otherwise how would it all come together? Is his body in a perfect harmony with air and light and green and water? Yes or no? that he's dependent on, but in a perfect harmony with. Yeah. Thank you. And now the big question, here's the other one. Mm. You came out of perfect harmony, union of male, female, where one empowered the other as equals and opposites. You did. It was so powerful and so beautiful, it created you, didn't it? Mm. It created synchronistically mother and father, your mother and father. And isn't that a beautiful relationship? It might be fraught with social limits and so forth, as they always are, but the basic function of mother-father nurturing came into life synchronistically with your pro-creation, didn't it? Pro, I love that word, pro. Mm. Two became <coughs> one. And that's a fact, that male-female is your reality. Of all, whether you're in a human male body or a human female body, we are all male female. Right? And all life is male female. That's how God is functioning. A flower is the exchange of male female chemistries. A tree is male female, you know, strong trunk, soft foliage, receptive foliage, no foliage without the trunk, no, no trunk without the foliage receiving nutrients. We're all that, right? And I'm saying that harmony of male-female is how life is functioning. It is your present condition. Do you accept that? Yes. <laughs> Are you thinking about it? You're the perfect union of yeah, my, my parents, their name is Pat and Joan. And they met on, on a hill, Mount Eden, at Teachers College male, female, you know, I think of them as before they became mother, father, I think of them as those young people. And then they came together, you know, something extraordinary happened. Like male, female collaboration is extraordinary. It is empowering, it creates new life. I'm not saying we all have to run around and have babies, but that's how powerful it is, this male, female. And I am pointing out to you, you sir, that this male-female harmony that is all life is your condition. It is your reality. No matter how screwy the power structures of religion made sex for humanity, no matter how messy it is, you are basically your substance of existence is the male-female union. And what this practice is that developed in the ancient world, you know, prior to 
any doctrine appearing before they invented the male power structure. There was this yoga, you know, the, so the pre-doctrinal yogas. What they were is your participation in this that you are, male, female, where the inhale is receptivity through the crown and frontal line all the way to the base of the body, and the exhale is the strength of your system in and up ascending, like the trunk ascending and the foliage descending. The inhale soft and receptive feminine, the exhale strength from the base ascending. Right? And this is what this yoga practice is. And I'm going to give it to you this afternoon and you're going to do it for 40 days because you've already agreed I tricked you into it. You're, no, just joking. You're going to do it and I'm saying this yoga is your participation in those natural harmonies and power that is the male-female collaboration as equals and opposites where one empowers the other. The inhale empowers the exhale and the exhale empowers the inhale, literally. You know? And then what happens is that then you're in your life as a very receptive uh, natural organism where half of your life can receive and your strength, your male strength is programmed to be receptive synchronistically as being strong. In fact, I even use this statement that strength is for receiving. That's why we have strength, to be able to receive. And if you do this consistently, these, these sort of life-correcting practices, where you start to <coughs> relax and be in the natural state, the natural state, which is power, which is intelligence, which is hum, the natural life on earth. That will arise for you uh, as a feeling. And even if difficulties continue, which they're likely to, you know, we live stressed out lives and society is very miserable right, right now, you know, people are suffering, people are traumatized everywhere. It might even be in your own family, you know, things are happening. Maybe things are even happening in you. I'm saying to you, if you steadily do this practice for, you know, a short time each day, it will reprogram the system to become utterly strong and receptive synchronistically. That will happen. And you will find a new capability in relationship to others, including relationship to others that the, the intimate relationship, the personal, intimate, sexual relationship with others will be there for you if we practice. I'm saying that this male-female power, harmony, beauty, natural collaboration is your state it's already your state. Are you with me on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, thank you. You don't have to get to it. And you don't have to get to God. Right? The getting, <coughs> getting to God implies God is absent. Trying to get to God implies God is absent. My teacher used to say, if you're looking for something, it implies that you don't have what you're looking for. Right? So then he had a beautiful say to toss up. So the looking is the problem. He say, stop looking, start living. And by your confession, this looking has been put in us. We're programmed to be seeking for some future possibility for ourselves. That's the problem. And it might be God or it might be enlightenment. <clears throat> or it might be, as we drove into North Perth, I saw uh, Maserati. Alfa Romeo, that great big building going up for Land Rover and Jaguar. Whoa, what are those fuckers doing? To our <laughs> that's why our fires are, that's why the human life is ending. That's why the, Australia is burning and they're putting all their economy into these glamorous buildings and shiny objects. 
where people feel like they've attained something in life if they get one of these stupid machines <laughs> of leather seats. Kill the cow, put them in a Maserati. <laughs> <laughs> and it gives a man a sense of uh, <clears throat> attainment because he can't receive his own woman. You know, he can't have beautiful, intimate sex as equal and opposite with his own partner. So he buys a Maserati, he buys a set of wheels and feels good for a couple of days till that feeling wears off. If the public are not given actual intimacy with life, then these, you know, <clears throat> this stupid overproduction of stuff and some of the stuff is a major pollutant that are ruining the human life, you know. Like really ruining it. Like we're really at risk. You saw how at risk we are in Australia. Australia and the rest of the world. It just Australia is just a little blip of this problem just happened here, but it's a global problem. And we don't get hip to this thing that you can be fully intimate and satisfied and sexually satisfied, intimate with reality itself, intimate with each other in same sex or opposite sex intimacy, profoundly grateful for the powers of the cosmos that arise in relationship to somebody else. If we don't give this to the public as folk activity quickly, then we're all out of here. One scientist said that us scientists, we have the means, we could bring climate chaos uh, under control if we had a free reign to get going with the human resources that are available to us. We could fix the problem and we could fix it quickly. But he said the problem is not a scientific one, the problem is a human emotional one, the, the problem is fear and greed and a lack of connection to life as it actually is. That's the problem. This, this is fundamental assumption in the human societies of every kind that we are separate from Mother Nature. And Mother Nature is something that we rape and use. And, and you know, literal women, are, we rape and use women to get access to some sort of resource. We rape the Mother Earth to get access to energy, you know, and build factories and so forth and create stuff that we can sell to people and exploit people with and create fake desires like desires for a Maserati you know rather than give the people the tools the mechanism the means to be intimate with their own reality the power of this cosmos that brought this body into existence in the first place you know and the power of this cosmos that is presently your body that is beating your heart moving your breath and sex and your mind that can think and your ears that can hear and your eyes that can see that and your hair that can grow that beauty is on you and it's happening and it's happening so amazingly in harmony and dependence with the rest of the ecology you're good you're good you know you can relax now enjoy your life <laughs> <laughs> don't meditate don't struggle with some absurd gymnastics that's been turned into more bullshit that they're calling yoga. Don't do that. It breaks the body down. You get hurt. You build anxiety in the nervous system. The joints wear out. All that stuff that's been taught by ignorant men who turned business, yoga into business from about the 1950s onwards and totally conned the public thinking that there was something there. There's nothing there. Your yoga must be actually yoga. And I want to make sure you get, yes, though. When you say don't meditate, um, I find it um, uh, a time that I really come to myself. So instead of doing the interview or this or that, just to sit for a while and breathe. I and thank you for doing that. I'm asking you to understand that you are always, already, eternity arising as the whole body. Are you? Yes. Right. 
And you don't have to get to that, do you? No. Right. What Sometimes you'll... I tend to forget. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, no, fair enough. Well, what I would agree with you. Please find time to sit quietly every day. <laughs> Why not? But I'm asking you not to seek in this idea of trying to get somewhere with a thing called meditation. This thing, this thing of like trying to be reside as awareness to your troubled mind. Trying to reside as consciousness. But that is senior to all arising conditions. It's a, it's a, that's another whole subject, that hoax that's been put on humanity. It's not yoga. To transcend all conditions, to transcend sex, to transcend women. Ramakrishna, a great Indian saint of recent times in Calcutta, would say, you know, women in gold are the problems. <laughs> they ruin your journey to God. And it's just a deep cultural assumption. What yoga is, is your embrace of an eternity that is the whole body. Your whole body is so beautiful and so intelligent and so in harmony with the cosmos, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So I don't want you to create any philosophy about, you know, my friend wrote in his post today, I loved it, he said, why bother with learning a body of knowledge if you don't have knowledge of your body? So, my fifth principle is that asana, pranayama, and meditation and life are a seamless process. That if you do your asana and pranayama, meditation will arise naturally. It will make bring clarity to your mind. And I want you to prioritize doing asana in your daily routine, not meditating. And when you do your asana and pranayama, meditation will arise and you'll naturally want to sit there motivelessly for a period of time. Yeah? Are you with me? Yeah. Yeah. So, when I say don't meditate, I'm not putting down your time of being quiet in the day, but I'm saying prioritize doing asana practice that I'm about to teach you. Make that the point because it clarifies the mind and then meditation arises. This thing is called meditation. And what is asana and pranayama? Your, what is yoga? It is your direct embrace of the power of the cosmos. This eternity that is arising as you. Right? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So am, am I making sense to you in the corner? Are you the power of the cosmos? So you are. Is your are you a pure intelligence? How life is functioning in you as you? Are you the beauty of the natural world? Yeah. There's a little thing we have to add in there. You know, it's a common, you know, the parlance of media and saying, Oh, you're so beautiful. You're a beautiful woman, you know, all of that. Put you on the cover of a magazine, Vogue magazine, or Yoga Journal, or some nonsense. <laughs> Sell some gymnastics to the public, right? Thin body typed, doing something exaggerated on yourself, and everybody goes, "Whoa, that's so amazing, so beautiful." Well, that is an insidious beauty that's been created by male power structure. By church, by state, that's still being created by power structures of creating the idea of beauty to sell shit to people and to sell and using sex to sell stuff. And what it's done is programs the mind of the public, it programs women to try to emulate that and be like that, you know. And the whole life is dedicated to this effort, this gross effort or sometimes subtle effort to be looking like something else. And you know, yoga has played right into that, right into that. It's, uh, yoga is part of this illness called body dysmorphic dysfunction, where women hate their bodies because they do, doesn't look like the image that they've been programmed to, that they should look like. 
So I'm not, when I say you are the beauty, I'm not saying that. That insidious beauty that makes women miserable and makes men miserable too. Because the men can't experience the beauty unless it's the sexy, you know, yoga journal lady. The one on TV. Yeah, or the one on TV, or the one in Vogue magazine, or the one in Woman's Day, you know, the celebrity look that everybody is trying to align themselves to, right? Now, with great respect, that's been put in you in Australia and everywhere else in the West. You know, it came to an extreme in LA. So, particularly crazy in LA where people are carving up their faces to look like something else. You know. Like, really, and nobody acknowledges it. Nobody talks about it openly. People just do this bizarre stuff on themselves. It's a deep, deep sickness. And I'm telling you that the popular yoga brands and styles have played right into that. A part of that dysmorphic dysfunction. And what I want you to see in one go, one grasp of it, is that oh, oh, my God. the gum trees, the light on the leaves, the body, the beauty, the beauty of life on earth. And when you look at beauty, you look at the gum tree, for example, it is beauty that perceives beauty. And the human condition is profound condition of a profound species. That's why, you know, Mother Earth does actually want us to protect our own species. Mother Earth does want us here. We came out of this sludge, you know, a few billion years back, I don't know where it was, when it was, but we were green sludge. That's what we were, life. And it took Mother Earth this long, billions of years, to get you sitting there in the corner. <laughs> yeah, billions of years, with a mind that can speak about these things and can analyze atoms, <laughs> can analyze our own structures of the beauty of Mother Nature. How extraordinary. And minds that can say, I love you. And I feel you, I embrace you. You know, the alchemy of the, the merge, the union, you know? We're there now, we are at that place. You're at that place. And you can profoundly enjoy your life from now on. And you know, I know how it is in society and probably many people in this room, the, the, the failure of relationship, the failure of sex, the pain in sex because the normative sex behaviors are dreadful in, in society, in Australia and everywhere else. It's a male dominance, you know. It's the male emptying himself from the feminine, using the feminine like a, 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 a receptacle or something, a spittoon that you, you know, rele stress release. And it's very painful for, for women, but it's painful for men because they don't, are not able to receive their partners. It's just shoddy shoddy deal that the church dished up in the society that it created and as, as I said before we might have left the church but the thought structures and the behaviours that were created are still in us you know and I know it's hard and it has been hard in the early experiments with sexuality and the disappointments and so forth that we've all suffered as men and women and I want to promise you that if you start to practice yoga in this way that is right for you as it evolved in the ancient shamanic world and then in the flourished between the 8th and the 13th century, there's 500 years of profound learning and development of yogic life. It's one of the great wonders of human life, what humanity has brought forth. You know, It's a great cultural treasure, <coughs> yoga that we hold. That if you practice this, and I can give it to you, and I'll tell you why I can give it to you, uh, you will reprogram your system to become participant only in the given reality, and not a struggle with some sort of uh, psychological presumption that you are less and have to become more. Are you with me on that? You're not less. You cannot be less. You cannot be 
below anybody and you can't be above anybody you know you can't be you can't be second to a greater idea or a greater person and you can't be superior to anybody either you're the power of the cosmos for god's sake you're the beauty of the cosmos the beauty is that right yeah. thank you you're in perfect harmony with the rest of existence right yeah. thank you male female polarity beauty where one pole and one powers the other is your state isn't it yeah. thank you it was that's what got you here that's what you are and it's easily within your capability to enter into a profound alchemy with another person it could be same sex or opposite sex intimacy with no question around what gender anybody is in the uh, spectrum of, ma of mother nature's biology you know male female spectrum of biology that is all life so it's not a gender issue at all but the question is, is will you receive another and will another receive you where receptivity is the most of the point you know that strength is receiving that you're not just doing strength, 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 trying to attain, trying to get somewhere in some male absurdity. So are you with me on that? I'm not talking about, I'm not saying you're a beautiful woman, although you might say that of you, you know, in the normal parlance of language. But I also warning us against that stupid idea that beauty is something that you get to, that beauty is something you can capture and have. This uh, obsession, cultural obsession that we've got right now with you know, iPhones and Instagram and all that nonsense of trying to capture beauty and experience beauty. My guru used to say, you'll never capture beauty. The mind is too slow. You can't capture it. And even if you did capture it, it would cause dreadful seeking in you from that time onwards where you thought you would, didn't have it. There is a cultural obsession with trying to capture beauty. And I mean that in every way, art and everything. It's like trying to hold it, grasp it, get it again, duplicate it again. You know, it's a madness on the human condition. I want you to be relieved of all of that. I want you to know and feel and enjoy the beauty that is your state that is your natural state that nobody need give to you and no one can take from you you are that are you with me yeah and even if you don't do any yoga even if i don't teach you any yoga you know basically that you are this the power of the cosmos arising of pure intelligence an unspeakable beauty that is all life on this God realm, this, whatever this is, this beauty that is the earth, that is now so vulnerable for the human species. You know, Mother Earth is not vulnerable, but the human species is vulnerable on the earth. But I do say that Mother Earth wants us to survive. She wants us to get cooperative with her because she brought us from green sludge five billion years ago to these forms that we are and these forms are extraordinary you know that in the Veda they say you know God created the human condition so God could enjoy God you know could enjoy our own reality and we are we this is an extraordinary phenomena is the body is everybody so I want you to simply walk out of here knowing that enjoying that from now on and if there is ever some restriction that seems to be there in your life you do a little yoga that's all and the yoga as it was came through the great tradition the yoga as it developed in the shamanic world and then got brought forth and flourished 8th to the 13th century and then lost again and look, my brief little story on that is that not a little story and not brief <laughs> but in, in summary 
this great fellow, uh, Turamalai Krishnamacharya, who was the teacher to Iyengar, who popularized yoga in Patabi Joyce, that, that the whole studio business, you know, gymnastics that's been popularized and called yoga, on, you know, studios on every street corner, everywhere. Um, that those young men, their teacher was Krishnamacharya. And Krishnamacharya lived to 101 years old, died in 1989. And he did an extraordinary work. In his early life, he was a scholar and he went to the city of Varanasi, which is the hub of Hindu learning, the, the learning of Tantra, the Tantras, the great texts. And he was a scholar of all the uh, ancient philosophies of his own culture. But he was stuck with something as his guru Ramanuja Acharya of the 10th century had declared. And Ramanuja is sort of like a Christ or a Pope or, you know, Krishna, a very important cultural uh, phenomena, these gurus. And he pronounced that there must be yoga to realize what's called Advaita Vedanta. Advaita means not two, only one. There is only one. There is only God. That yoga is needed to actualize that. And yoga is the union of opposites in our own system implies male-female collaboration. And he also pronounced that the saints and sages were appearing in uh, family life. Men and women in family life were the, were the yogic realizers, not the renunciate who moved away from the feminine. Right? But the <clears throat> the uh, yogi who merged with the feminine the yogi who could receive another. And we have to say in same sex or opposite sex intimacy to be able to receive. This was a requirement for God realization in that culture of Advaita. And Ramanuja did sort of pronounce that and it was part of Krishnamacharya's culture. So in all of his 11 years of study in the universities of Varanasi, he was stuck with this thing that there had to be yoga to realize religious possibility you know and he was looking everywhere in Varanasi and around India and Tibet and there was he couldn't find a reliable source of yoga that was like um, as accurate and that would, would satisfy his um, scholarly discernment he couldn't find it it had gone out of India it had gone from the 13th century on suppressed denied you know that is male, female is equal and opposite. That there were uh, women sages had vanished. It's all male stuff. In Tibet, for example, written out of human history, the Dakinis, you can't even know about them. There are some extraordinary women there who brought the dharmas through, and you don't even hear about them. They're not in the temples. You know, they're all the glamorous men, the big Buddhas, and so forth. If there's a statue of a woman, it's a tiny diminutive little thing that has no, can't even notice them, you know. So it wasn't there, it wasn't there. And he heard about this one man, uh, Rama Mohan Brahmachari, in Lake Manasarova at the foot of Kailash. And he went three and a half months of walking to find his guru. And he studied there. The guru must have been a very cool dude because he stayed with him for seven and a half years and um, in his, with his family in a cave in Manasarova. And then he studied. He, so I'd say he rescued these tantras from the ancient world that had almost completely disappeared. We might not have had them. You know. And then at a certain point, his guru said, now you go back into South India and you bring this yoga to the world, to the whole world. He said, find a good woman, find a wife. And he did. Well, his family did. He found a good woman for him. Her name is uh, uh, Namagiri Aman. And uh, he's, he got this yoga education. And from that time, he worked and worked to bring yoga into the world and to acknowledge the, um, to end misogynism and bring men and women into equal and opposite empowerment with each other, that yoga does. He started that pioneering work. 
and I'll bring it to you. We just went on this trip all around the Western countries and China and everywhere we went. And then we went to Kailash and we went to this, these places. We went to uh, Lake Manasarova and found the cave where Krishnamacharya lived. And we went <coughs> and expressed our gratitude around Kailash. You know, thank you, thank you, source of yoga. Yay, we're from the West and thank you so much. Every step of the way we walked along, you know, <laughs> it was sort of gratitude. And then to my deep surprise, I found there were women in these ancient places, in the, like the caves of Milarepa and the stupas, the Buddhist places of holy pilgrimage. There were women there and men, but and they were quietly saying to us back, thank you, thank you for holding our dharma that is almost lost on planet earth and bringing it to the whole of humanity. Thank you. And it was like a quiet communication from them. It's a curious thing in human life. Christians know about this. If somebody is not obstructed at all in body and mind from the power of creation, like Christ, that personality seems to continue on after their death as a transmission device. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. It's deep in uh, Vedic culture, this phenomena. And I felt that. Like I, I was really taken by surprise to find that there were women, ancient women, Dakinis, who were speaking like, like in spiritual whispers, saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for taking this and bringing it to the world. And I'm saying that to you because that's my experience and that's what I'm bringing to you in this brief meeting that we have, this, these ancient tantras that anybody can do, no matter who you are, no matter what your body type, age or health is, or your culture, you can do this. And you can do it in your own home. You can practice these tantras. And fully enjoy the beauty, the power, <laughs> the harmony that is life on earth. And be finished with seeking. Finished with try like, trying to meditate struggling with the mind to realize something. You don't have to do that. The mind is arising as a function of life, you see. And when you move and link the breath to the whole body, then the mind follows the breath automatically. And therefore the mind gets linked to the whole body. And the whole body is pure intelligence. The whole body is beauty of life. And therefore that becomes uh, the mind's realization. The mind then starts to notice that it is indeed arising from the heart as a function of the heart, as a function of life then. So this asana is pure treasure from the ancient shamanic world. And it's not some exaggeration that you have to do on yourself. It's something that you can easily, easily do. So then we went back to Mysore with the place where <coughs> Krishnamacharya taught. And that is a very interesting history there, how he started his, really his career as a yoga teacher in the world. And uh, a few special people like his son and a few, not many, uh, stayed with him and got it. But unfortunately what happened is that some of the young men in the shala where he taught in the palace of Mysore, uh, under the patronage of the Maharaja Mysore, the king, who was his student and his patron, uh, they took it. They took the gymnastics. They, no doubt they loved the gymnastics, but they forgot the rest of the teaching. And they took it, and Iyengar went to Europe in 1954, and with a great deal of bravado and um, business intensity, uh, taught his stuff, but it was completely dislodged from what Krishnamacharya had actually taught. And so far in the West, the public have been, in the area of yoga, have been um, just distracted by that idea of yoga. And the sad thing about it is it's branded yoga as this sort of exaggerated effort that you do on yourself, this male muscular effort. 
without receptivity. It's still male misogynism. No receptivity in it. Yeah. Isn't that a part, though, of the culture of Europe, places like that, that even should you have the spirituality inside you, that people are not receptive because their culture doesn't allow for that so much? Yeah. So it's very difficult to teach yeah. a, a people who are not, who are blocking that. And so I, I feel that Iyengar, I agree with you, and I've studied a lot of stuff about yoga and Iyengar and stuff, mm -hmm. but my experience is in the places like Europe and the Western world that people are very adverse to spirituality. I disagree. Well, can I just, yeah, are you from Europe? Yes. Hey, I'm from Europe. Uh, <laughs> I mean, not, not to so, make huge yeah. assumptions, so, but hey. yeah, I know that there's a whole openness in a whole society that's really open as well. There's, you know, there's a clarity in that. Maybe it's coming back, but there was definitely a period where I think it was, um, especially in things like yoga, you know, a lot of people I spoke to used to say, well, I would love to go to yoga, but I don't want all that spiritual shit. Well, that's exactly what yoga is. So, yeah. Listen, and you can, you can say that Iyengar exploited the yes. European mind. So he, didn't, didn't get a gym. He, he didn't. He didn't make any alternative contribution, actually. But he produced a very sort of rigid system of, you know, male attainment in yeah. some idealism. Well, and, but and so the, the Europeans, well, people. Westerners who came to Iyengar, he became famous because the system happened to be the style of teaching that resonated with people's existing experience. Like he only became famous. Like we were with Angela Farmer and she said her, her teachers had her at school and then Iyengar whacked her with a stick and she thought, oh, they must be a good teacher. That was the, the because she was whacked at English schools yeah. by stern teachers and Iyengar did the same, so you know he slotted into that. So there was no, nothing really helpful there. I, I Sad to say that I felt a similar thing. I, I, I loved Iyengar to start with as my first introduction, but it was very competitive, which I was yeah. later found that that was nothing to do with yoga. Yeah. Well, it's purely that physical. Was def, that was definitely in the, in the yoga schools, like how long could you hold this posture? You know? Well, it was all about alignment and it's complete so athletic stuff. What I want to promise you is that I bring you the way that Krishnamacharya actually taught, that Mr. Iyengar ran away from and never had the opportunity to do it. And I'm also saying <clears throat> that it is spiritual practice. Yeah. Yoga is the necessary, if there's restrictions on the body of mind, we need yoga as the means to release those restrictions out of our system. And our systems are deeply restrictive because of the society we were born into. There's no way out of this. Mm -hmm. And so we need to learn these actual yogas that Krishnamacharya brought forth. And I want to promise you, it's a, It's not a matter of... that. See, he said anyone who wants to can do this. There doesn't have to be any fancy spiritual language or philosophy. But anyone who wants to feel better in these streets of Perth, if you can get this to them, they're going to feel better if you ask them to do it. So this lady burst into tears at Flow Festival yesterday. She was uh, in her, I'd say, mid-50s, and her beautiful son was there who was like in his 20s. Hmm? What? That wasn't her son. Yes, it was. Yeah, it was her son. And um, they, her mother said, burst into tears about the situation of Australia and the behaviours of male in Australia. And she said, what to do, what to do? I said, go and see Malika. <laughs> <laughs> and there was another lovely woman, her name is Kate, you probably know her, uh, from Fremantle. Kate. Yeah, great, great, you know, mother of four children, you know, powerful yogini, and mm. she was so on to this, and she's done all the Iyengar and Ashtanga Vinyasa and all the gymnastic nonsense. And she, for the first, she was getting this strength receiving, this column of above to below, the column of air, the column of feeling. 
and, and she was going, whoa, thank you. She got the whole argument that yoga, that religion is direct intimacy with eternity, direct embrace. It's not a progressive activity towards someone getting it. It's embrace of it. As a great teacher said, religious life is not trying to know God. It is participation in God. I was like, God and sex is religious life, is yogic life. And that these methodologies that came from shamanic world through the tantras of the 30, up to the 13th century, rescued by Krishnamacharya, are the tantras of direct embrace of, of what we are, of the power of this cosmos. And I promise you that. And, you know, you might be able to say, I say to you, you're the power of the cosmos. And you go, oh, shit, yeah, of course. And you might walk out of here and be realized of that for the rest of your life because you are that. That's humanly possible. There are documented cases of people in India who were told by their gurus, you, you know, and they, that's it. No question of practicing anything. If that doesn't happen to you, I hope it does, it might. What you can do now are these yogas of participation in the given reality and it will clear the thing up for you quite quickly. Yeah. So thank you for that inquiry. And you know, and we, this lady, so emotional, so powerful in her feeling as a woman, as a mother, saying, what to do? What's the next step? You know, Australia's burning, what to do? And I'm saying, the thing that Malika is doing, let it thrive. Let this be all around. Let it be in every suburb of Australia. And get the job done. And teach the people, get people trained. Sir, I want you to do that. I want you to practice for 40 days. And get the feeling of yoga in you. The feeling of the utter, you know, not, not even a question anymore. You are the power of the cosmos. It is arising as pure intelligence. You are the beauty. By the way, could I just check? Is that the beauty? All the women here. <laughs> it is true. It's, a, it's not an abstract statement. It's not a, like a spiritual statement, some sort of like poem that is pro provoking you to then try to realize it. Are you with me? It's not an abstract statement. It's a plain fact. Are you with me on that? So once you get the fact, like two plus two is four, two oranges, two oranges, uh, once you get that, then uh, you relax about it. And I want you to get it, the fact that you are that. Then, enjoy your life. And if there's any restriction at all, or probably you want to do it anyway, even when there's no restriction, just do a little yoga. Not obsessively, but do it each day. Then you will find, as time goes by, you will be able to approach somebody with, you know, for somebody that you are attracted to, you know, where you like somebody, you love somebody, you lust somebody, and give lust at the honourable place where it deserves to be. Love and lust. Lust is good. Lust is how Mother Nature is functioning to ensure the improvement and evolution of the species you know who chooses who and why lust is good and honor that don't feel bad about yourself for desiring sexually it's god's method so where these three l's are present you move to that person and you have an honest exchange and see what is there if you're doing your receptive, your receptive practice, inhale through the, you know, it's receiving through the crown and the frontal line of the body all the way to the genitals that become part of the receptive aspect of life. Then the behavior of your genitals became, are in the context of nurturing, 
of complete receptivity, right? Are you with me? So even then, your penetration of the feminine is useful because it is part of the nurturing, right? It is deeply sensitive to your intimate partner. This is a requirement to solve the dreadful terrorism between the male female the dreadful state that humanity is in in its sexuality there were all we, we have all suffered I bet everybody in this room has their stories does anyone not have a story about male female dysfunction does anyone Aren't you perfect? <laughs> the alchemy of the male-female union, because that's how life is working. No? I thought, possibly, <laughs> at least one. No, you see, these, these dreadful dark patterns are, are on us all. It's on you, sir, and I'm not pointing you out specifically, of course, but just all people born into the society take on the patterns and the pain of their parents and duplicate them. And if you're younger than 28, there's not a lot you can do about it, but after 28, they can completely go complete. How old are you? 26. All right, so it's almost <laughs> gone out of you. See, <laughs> you, you, you it's because it's so cycles, so Yeah, and it's the, exactly. For that. the cords. The yeah. For that reason, if you get practicing this now, this yoga, do a practice every day. By the time you're 28, you'll be walking free. Is the power and beauty of the cosmos, and you'll be able to enter into receptivity, the alchemy of two people intimate with each other. It'll be there for you, and I promise you that. So us oldies are naked. Huh? Yeah, both of them. You guys are naked. Yeah. You've got to do a lot more than footy time. It's hard, to, <laughs> it's hard to Australian language. <coughs> so, what does that mean? Us guys are naked? Yeah. <laughs> I had to work fast to hear that, what you were saying. No. I, I'd say, you know, so, uh, what was it? So, uh, G, we went to a meeting to see him. One, oh, of, one of the guys put it up here. Uh, yeah, excuse me, mate. <laughs> you called him mate. You know? <laughs> yeah, and he's just sitting there at the front. And he didn't really pick up on it too much, but I did nothing. That, that's good because he was mate. Yeah, but it was sort of a different. You know, he just like we were coming out. The Aussie yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, it's good. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, we had the discussion before. You're the power of the cosmos. I, I might have missed something about the 28. That was well, it's just a, it's a, it's an astrological thing. That your childhood karmas, your parent, you, a child mm. duplicates their parents, mm. no matter what. Mm. Right? Then if, you <coughs> cannot fight that. No. You can't transcend that until you are 28, and at 28 you can. And if he's got he's 26, he starts practicing. He'll be like flying when he's 28. Mm. And but it's the same for all of us. So you start to practice and you transcend. After 28, you can get free of your childhood karmas completely. He says can, not will. Yeah, can. So you know, like thank you for your sincerity and it. You know, you're a very honest man. And you're saying, yeah, there are, there are limits in me. You know, there are patterns in me that trouble me. That's a very that's the starting point. The Krishnamacharya called it the unavoidable motive of practice. Mm. The unavoidable motive is to notice that there's restriction. And then you go, fuck, I'm restricted. And you go, okay, what can I do about it? It was like the big public question that the mother uh, said yesterday when she started weeping. She said, what's the next step? Well, you were there, weren't you, Craig? Yeah. Wasn't it so beautiful and powerful? A mother saying, a mother, Australian mother saying, what to do? What's the next step? And I, I said, the next step is start practicing so you know these yogas and then start teaching them to the public like Malika is, so beautifully. That's the next step. 
If we don't do that, our scientists can never solve the problems because of public fear, public grief, because of misogyny, the, you know, the womenless men who have been the world leaders, the religious leaders, who are not able to receive <coughs> the power of the feminine and the power of Mother Earth, but exploited Mother Earth and exploit the feminine. That's why the women are so outraged and, and validly so. Like, fuck, enough's enough, you know? Now what to do about it? And that these pre-doctrinal yogas must be given for each and every person, men and women, because the women is patterned in the same way. Mm. The lack of receptivity. Mm. So it's all male pattern, but the women are patterned with male pattern. Mm. It's all everybody bullying each other, you know, everybody complaining, nobody taking responsibility for their own situation. And I'm saying this, these yogas are the means to start participating in life rather than complaining about life. It's the, these yogas are the way to participate in God rather than seeking for God. These yogas are the way to participate in sex rather than seeking for sex. Either by denying sex in some religious glamorized idea of celibacy, which is a thing, or exploiting sex with vulgarity and exaggeration, which is also a thing. And one has come from the other. So I really so grateful to meet you and feel your sincerity here and I'm so honored to know Malika who is definitely a yoga master and I, maybe you too Remy but we only met two days ago so I, I can't say that with all honesty because I don't know you but it might be true of you too but Malika has studied the tantras and knows them and feels them and practices them. And it has qualified her practice, her own experience, not because I've said it and she's listened to me or something. It's because it's in her own experience. It's not because she's some, you know, some insidious sort of fan of Mark Whitwell or some bullshit. It's because she's been given the ancient yogas and she's practicing them herself. And she knows how they work and they, she knows what they've done for her and now she can pass it on to you according to your body type, your age, your health and your culture. And this is the way forward now. And if she teaches, if half of you in this room begin to practice under Malika's guidance and then start to teach, then it's like, it'll go out, it'll go into the society, you know. And human beings will become intimate with our own reality and then be able to cooperate with Mother Nature, you know, and stop building cars that pollute the planet and all the rest of it. Then we'll do it. We won't do it if we think we're separate from nature. That's the problem. Malika reminds me of the Dakinis that I met around Kailash. Uh, were quiet women, powerful women, who hold the tantras and transmit them. She doesn't just remind me of such women. I know that she is such a woman. Quietly appearing, no big fanfare, just a yogini practicing and sharing a beautiful space and making these tantras available to the people. It's Malika is the hope of humanity. But we need a load of Malikas. We need them everywhere, women and men, of course, who will teach the actual yoga tantras and not this, these absurd gymnastics that they're calling yoga. You know? So, I'm just about ready to give you a practice. Is there anything else about anything else? So, do you have any questions about ecology and Krishna and Arjuna or anything whatsoever? It's a bit of a long conversation, I think, but 
as long as you can assure me that it's, the plight is still the same thing. I was a little confused because I'm not fluent in the Bhagavad Gita. Yeah, yeah. That it might just be a battle of egos, but is there a battle? Between there is a battle. Light and dark. Well, there's definitely a battle. You know, you, right now, you know we're in a battle. Australia is in a battle right now, isn't it? Mm. Right. Humanity is in a battle. So yeah, there's a battle. Yeah. And you can describe it as light and dark, but it's just a battle of survival in plain terms, you know. Yeah. And the, the point about the Bhagavad Gita is this great uh, mystic mythology. And some people say, no, it's not mythology. It was a historic event. And was it Krishna? Was he, you know, the personification of the absolute condition of reality, the power of the cosmos? Well, yeah, but so is everybody. <laughs> so are you, right? You're Krishna, walking, talking, in your ordinary Australian form. But they're going into battle, and he's freaked out. He doesn't want to do the battle. Like the, the forests are burning, the air is polluted, people are dying in Australia. And we're freaked out. We don't want to do what we have to do to save ourselves, right? Mm. There's a battle, for sure. And Arjuna says, Krishna, I'm freaked out. I don't want to be here. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do my duty. I don't want to do my life. I don't want to do my dharma, right? So Krishna looks graciously at the fearful Arjun, the yogi, and he said, Oh, Arjuna, he said, sacrifice the inhale to the exhale. Sacrifice the exhale to the inhale. Be a yogi, oh Arjuna. He said a lot of other stuff too. He said to take the action of no action. Be free of the fruits of action. You know, just act without needing the result necessarily. Just see what comes of your action, but act. He did say you act. Right? So it's all, it's, a, it's beautiful. And what is striking to me, it is text from 5,000 years ago. So they were talking about this. And, that, and it must have evolved for thousands of years before that to get to that place where they, where they could talk about it so specifically. But this is what Krishna said to Arjuna, sacrifice the inhale to the exhale and the exhale to the inhale. Be a yogi, O oh Arjuna. Now look, that is my own experience, my experience of many friends now. If you have fear in life and you don't quite want to do your life as you know you should be doing it, you know, Australia is burning and all the rest of it. This mother's mother and her sons, like, worried for young Australian males been growing up in Australia. What can I do as a mother? What's the step? You know, oh. The answer from Krishna, the Lord, God, said, sacrifice the inhale to the exhale, sacrifice it. Be a yogi, O oh Arjuna. That's what he said. Can I ask you one And thing? I say, but listen, I'm not Krishna, I'm Mark, but I'm saying that to you. I'm saying, do your inhale and exhale. Do it every day. And try doing it every day. And be, don't just be a fan of yoga. But be a yogi. Just take it on. Simply, not obsessively, daily. And you will find that you'll be able to do your dharma then. Do your duty in life. Work hard to save the planet. Does it affect everybody's dharma? Yeah. It's not one... So everyone has this moral obligation? Yes. They just need to discover it. A moral obligation to be the nurturing that life is, to be participating in the nurturing that is life. Life is nurturing. Life is powerful, regenerative healing. And to participate in that, that's what we do. Mother, father, and then the going on in life and caring for each other in the ways that we can. And my, uh, my certainty is that if there's Malika teaching Aust all Australian men, soon the men who are all the miners and the men who are, you know, exploiting the planet and, and you know, just selling shit to people that we don't need, you know, 
Eugene, my teacher, would say, all you need is shelter, clothing, and food. And, you know, an intimate touch with somebody else. If you got those, who cares? It's what life is. We don't need a million dollars. We need clothing, food, shelter, touch, human intimacy. If you got those, you're good. You don't need God seeking. You know, you don't need to deny any condition of the ordinary reality to be intimate with all ordinary conditions. That's what we need. So do your yoga. Was there something else? No. All right, are we good? So I'm going to, Malika's a yoga master. My goal is to turn everybody else into that by asking you to really practice. And don't just be a fan of yoga and don't imagine that yoga is something that you only do in a class. Classes are good, especially with Malika. But do the class and then go home and do your practice on a daily basis. Can I ask you something? Will you practice this tomorrow morning before you come here? A little 10 minute practice. Will you? And then we'll check it out tomorrow how it goes. Please stand up. Thank you. Oh, but do you need a bathroom break or should you? No, it's only one. Let's keep going. Stay here.